let me welcome you to the Kundua Full Moon Boya Day Dhamma International Dhamma Program. This is the last uh, Full Moon Boya Day for this year. And for Sri Lankans, uh, Udua Full Moon Poe Day is of uh, special significance due to the arrival of Sangamita Teri with the Jaya Sri Mahabodhi tree chaplain and the establishment of the Bhikkhuni Sasan. <laughs> Queen Anula was the first to be ordained. Advent of Arahat Mahinda on Poson Full Moon Day marked men entering the Buddhist order. Today, the center of attraction, center of Buddhist attraction will be the, the Sri Mahabodhi at Anradhu. Today on this Undua Full Moon Poe Day, we respectfully welcome Bante Sujato, who will deliver the International Dhamma Program on the topic, The Path to Enlightenment. Bante Sujato is co-founder of SutraCentral.net, Sydney, Australia. This website contains Dhamma literature, mainly the work of Bante Sujato, who has translated over 1 million Pali words to English. A feat unmatched and needs recognition of the great services rendered to the Buddha Sasa. Bante Sudato has been closely associated with the International Dhamma Program and providing very valuable Dhamma sermons to the many local and international followers of the Dhamma. Although we are faced with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been able to continue the Dhamma programs using technology via Zoom to the large number of Dhamma friends here and overseas. As you know, this Zoom programs were really started as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is uh, a novel feature or something that happened and also maybe was made compulsory and uh, have been able to make full use of it. Also, the practice of the Dhamma should be the foremost of all our Dhamma devotees. We also wish to thank uh, Ms. Deepika Virakun, a member of the Sutra Central Trust, for coordinating and providing all assistance and support for our Dhamma programs. Thank you very much, Deepika. We very You're much welcome. appreciate uh, your services. You're very welcome. As you are all aware, all these activities are done on a voluntary basis and requires the generous support of our Dhamma friends. Please visit the Sutta Central website and use it to develop your Dhamma knowledge and achieve the ultimate path to liberation. Also, I would invite our Dhamma friends to make a donation to Sutta Central as this uh, and the details are given in the web website and this will be another great contribution that you are making for the upliftment and the maintenance of the Buddha Sas. With respect, I invite uh, Ajahn Sujato, he of course prefers to be called Bante Sujato because when uh, <laughs> Ajahn Brahm was present. Uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm referred to as Ajahn Sujato, but I know that uh, uh, Ajahn Sujato uh, <laughs> uh, likes to be referred to as Bante, but certainly uh, I, 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 follow. I, I, Ajahn Brahm is allowed, he can do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to deliver uh, the Unduap, uh, uh, this is a morning program. Today uh, we are having two programs, one in the morning and the other one at uh, 7.30 in the evening that will be delivered by uh, Bante Henapula Gunratna Tero, who will be delivering it from Virginia, USA. 
So today's Dhamma program is on the topic of the path to enlightenment. And uh, I uh, now uh, will invite uh, Bhante Sujato to deliver Pansil and to commence the Dhamma program. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, 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 Thank you so much, Lakshman. And just uh, remind me, Lakshman, what, how, how long is the program for today? Uh, today it's now 10 o'clock till 11.30. 11.30, so one and a half hours. Yeah, okay. put it because there are some, some of them who have taken uh, observed seal, so they might uh, want to break off early in order for their dana. Right, yes, we could. That would be very bad merit for us if we were to stop okay. them from eating after taking pansil, after taking apasil. Okay, let us uh, recite the pansil. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sanghang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang chami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang chami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang chami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang chami. Parna tipata veramani si kapadang samadiami. Adina dana veramani si kapadang samadiami. Kame sumichatara veramani si kapadang samadiami. Musavada veramani si kapadang samadiyami Surame rayamajapamadathana veramani si kapadang samadiyami Imani pancha si kapadani silena sugatingyanti silena bhoga sampada Silena ni buting yan titas ma silang wiso na ye. Thank you. For those who, thanks so much, Lakshman, for that uh, introduction and for uh, to the uh, IDP and uh, Deepika and all our friends for hosting the event. Also, just uh, acknowledging the uh, the land that I'm speaking to you from today is the unceded land of the Baramadigal people of the Darug Nation, and I pay respects to their elders, uh, of past, present, and emerging. For those who may be interested, no one know why I prefer to be called Bante Sujata rather than Ajahn Sujata. Well, honestly, it's not such a big deal, really. But uh, my background was in the Thai forest tradition, the same same tradition as Ajahn Brahm. And of course, Ajahn is a Thai word from the Pali or Sanskrit word, Acharya. And since I'm not in Thailand and we're not speaking Thai, then I'm not sure why we should be using a Thai title. So I noticed that uh, a lot of the international monks uh, use Bhante and monks in, uh, in Sri Lanka, India, Malaysia and different places were using Bhante and it seemed to be a better kind of because it's Pali. So since Sujato is Pali, it seemed to make more sense to use a Pali title as well. Uh, so I usually use Bante Sujato or Venerable Sujato. Um, but if you want to call me Ajahn Sujato, that's also okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, so for, for today, so celebrating the wondrous occasion of the bringing of the Bodhi tree to uh, Sri Lanka by uh, Venerable uh, Sangamita, 
and uh, they and to reflect on the meaning of Bodhi, the meaning of enlightenment, and the meaning of the path to enlightenment. So one of the first things that we can bear in mind from that story, the story of Sangamita, is that enlightenment is not uh, restricted. It's not just for men. It's not just for people from a certain background, a certain class, a certain caste. It's not just for Bante, excuse me, if you can speak yes. a little loud, it might be better for the... Are we, are we too, are we quiet, are we? Okay. If uh, uh, it can be increased a little, it may be good. Okay, thank you for letting me know. My phone should be okay. Okay, uh, is, that, is that okay? Uh, now it's better. Now. now it's better, I'm a little bit closer to the mic now, okay. So it's not restricted by uh, age or sex or caste or wealth or uh, the color of one's skin or any of these kinds of things. All of the things that are used by people to divide each other, to separate each other, the things by which we say, I'm better than you, the things by which we judge, the things by which we, ask, we think that some people are more beautiful or more wealthy or more powerful or better. None of those things really matter from a spiritual point of view, from the point of view of enlightenment. And so the Buddha was quite adamant and very clear right from the beginning that enlightenment was open for everyone. It was something which was a human thing. I mean, not even technically speaking, not even human. I mean, we know that some of the devas could get enlightened and so on as well. So really it's something about sentient beings. One of the Buddha's favorite Say, oh, sayings that for my personal favorites, uh, the Buddha said, Where do you manasa? He says, uh, I, I declare that this is suffering to, for one who feels. This is the origin of suffering for one who feels. This is the ending of suffering for one who feels. This is the path leading to the ending of suffering for one who feels. Where do you manasa? So I'll just uh, uh, notice, Venerable. Alande Ananda has just joined us, so venerable. Good to see you after many years. I think last time I saw you was the occasion of the film showing Siddhartha in Colombo. So <laughs> I hope you're well. Yeah, very nice to see you too. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, where was I? Uh, but that's right, Four Noble Truths for One Who Feels. So, so long as we are somebody who has feelings, has emotions, who has uh, a capacity to feel pleasure and pain, then the Dhamma is for us. Now, the, the fact that the Dhamma is universal, the fact that it, it is meant for everyone, is something which is built in to the Dharma and to the Buddha's teachings at a very fundamental level. Uh, and when we see the now, of course, of course, the Buddha's uh, teachings uh, and language, the way that he expressed his teachings was, of course, shaped by his time and place, obviously, just as the way that I'm conveying teachings today is shaped by my background, my language, my cultural preconceptions by the technologies that we can use. These all affect how the manner in which we present what we're saying. But in terms of the content, the meaning of what the Buddha was saying, we can see that the Buddha was already uh, phrasing his key teachings in ways that would uh, relate to and appeal to anyone, regardless of where they, where they were. I mean, to start with, the Four Noble Truths, suffering. And if we hear the word suffering, then everybody can relate to that. No matter who you are, oh yeah, suffering, yeah, it's a real thing. And it doesn't mean that we just 
sort of get stuck in it. It doesn't mean that we get obsessed by our suffering and our victimhood. The Buddha wasn't, wasn't wanting us to be victims. He wanted us to respond to it. What do we do about it? And this is where the path to the ending of suffering comes in. So even though we have no say really on the fact that we are born in suffering, the fact that we experience suffering, we most certainly do have a say in how we respond to it. So in Buddhism, we should never see ourselves as being uh, the victims. We should never see ourselves as being helpless. Even if we can't physically do something, we can always change what happens inside. We can change how we respond to it. And so the Buddha taught us many skillful ways to respond to suffering. And one of those skillful ways I'm going to talk about today, uh, we call the bojangas or the, uh, uh, the awakening factors. And I'm sure most of you have heard these before. Most of, most of you will be somewhat familiar with them, but uh, these Dharma teachings are always something we need to go over again and again and again to make sure that we know them and make sure that we familiarize ourselves with them. So uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, if you don't know these seven uh, awakening factors, then hopefully by the end of the talk, you will. Uh, sati, mindfulness, Dhamma Vichaya, the investigation into Dhammas, which here can mean either uh, uh, phenomena, things, realities, but also teachings, uh, energy, uh, rapture, tranquility, Samadhi and Upeka. Is that all? Sati, Dhamma, which are energy, rapture, tranquility, Samadhi, Upeka. I think that's it. I think that's seven. So, <laughs> mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, rapture, tranquility, Samadhi, and Upeka. Okay, seven Bojangas. So this is one of the Buddha's expressions of the path to enlightenment. Now, of course, there are many different expressions of that, the Noble Eightfold Path being the best known. And each one of these expressions sort of maps out the way to freedom from a slightly different perspective. It's not teaching a different thing. right? It's not talking about a different reality. It's describing that reality in a slightly different way. Uh, and each of the ways that the Buddha had described those realities has a certain purpose and a certain uh, emphasis. And one of the things, there's a couple of things which are interesting about uh, this uh, set of the bojangas, the, the factors leading to awakening. One of the things which is interesting about them is that they strongly emphasize the emotional dimensions of the path to enlightenment, rapture, tranquility, uh, equanimity, and so on. It's not to say that the wisdom components are lacking, of course, but the more emphasis is on the emotional side of things, which is interesting. It's also an interesting feature of these group of seven dhammas that the wisdom factors come relatively early, whereas often uh, wisdom appears towards the end. Not always, of course, in the Eightfold Path also, we find the wisdom factor appears at the beginning. Another interesting detail of this one is how uh, it includes uh, equanimity in the group of Dhammas, which is somewhat unusual for a, a central set of Dhammas like this. So we'll have a look at some of these things and what it's talking about. But one thing that is clear about these things is that there's a strong emphasis on Samadhi and on the path to awakening uh, through mental development, through bhavana, and through the development of samadhi. In fact, some scholars have argued that uh, the bodhanga could, e could, could even be the samadhanga, the factors of samadhi. I don't think it's a very plausible argument myself, but that some people have argued that. But it's, it does underline the closeness of these things to the practice of samadhi, which, of course, reminds us if we're talking about the path, reminds us of the time before the Buddha's enlightenment, when the Buddha was lost, when he was, uh, he had tried all of these different paths to no avail. 
And then when everything seemed to have reached a dead end, he recollected his practice of jhana when he was a child. And he wondered, could that be the path to enlightenment? And then this intuition came to him. That indeed is the path to enlightenment. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the path to enlightenment. Anyway, let's have a bit of a look at the specific factors here. Break it down. First one, uh, mindfulness and sati. A little bit uh, unusual to have mindfulness as the first factor. Uh, now, the words, of course, the word mindfulness has become such a huge thing in the world today and in how Buddhism has been taught. And personally, I, I'm, I'm not a huge kind of fan of that. I, I think that what happens a lot of the times is that uh, people people take mindfulness out of Buddhism and then say, oh, great, we can do mindfulness. And then they find, well, actually, we have, there's other things that we need, actually. Like we need, well, what about when we speak? Oh, so then we have to have mindful speaking. And what about when we, uh, what about when we do things? We have to have some kind of morality. So we'll have kind of mindful behavior. And then, and so... <laughs> You gradually end up putting all of the parts of the eightfold back path back in there, which you took, I don't know, maybe just don't leave them out in the first place would have been a simpler road. But anyway, so even though I think that sometimes we go over the top in making everything kind of mindful this and mindful that, there's no doubt, of course, mindfulness was a very central part of the Buddhist teachings. Mindfulness was not uh, unique to Buddhism. That's, we know that the word sati uh, has a dual meaning of both memory uh, and also uh, maintaining an awareness. I'll come back to that uh, later. But we know that the word sati was used in the Brahmanical tradition to refer to the maintenance and memory of their scriptures. So that's one usage of it. We know that in the Buddha's own description of his former teachers under Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta. He says that under those teachers, he practiced and developed sati. And he said that those teachers had sati as well as he did. So clearly, the Buddha wasn't claiming that he invented the practice of sati. Uh, equally, when the Buddha, having left there, was practicing his uh, self-mortification practices, uh, where he was uh, practicing essentially Jainism or something very similar to Jainism, uh, he also described the way that he would walk with extreme mindfulness so that he wouldn't uh, hurt any creatures as he was walking. So, he, so it seems that the, the concept and the idea of sati was one of those ideas that was uh, prevalent and widely practiced among the spiritual seekers in the time of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha, uh, as, with, as he would so often, adopted it and gave it his own spin. So the fact, that, the fact that they're using the same word doesn't necessarily mean that they're using the same word in the identical way. Right? It doesn't, doesn't mean it's necessarily exactly the same thing, but it's still similar enough that we can call it mindfulness. So when the Buddha, he used the word mindfulness, he, he used it in these two senses. The first sense would be to, to re recall and recollect what was said and done long ago. And the second sense that he would use mindfulness is, was in terms of a awareness in the present, uh, anupasi viharati, one, one dwells observing. So I think that's, it's an interesting reflection to look at those two different aspects. Um, why are these two apparently separate ideas uh, linked through this word? Why, why is it that remembering something from the past is so closely associated with what we think of as being uh, observing in the present? Well, I think part of the answer to that lies in, uh, uh, lies in the, the way that the term evolved through the Brahmanical traditions before the Buddha. And we have descriptions in the Brahmanical 
called texts called the Aranyakas that talk about how to memorize the Vedas. And the Brahmins would, uh, having uh, completed their duties in the household, uh, they would withdraw into the forest, go to a secluded place, sit there quietly and raise their mind to their God. And with a spirit of reverence and joy would call to mind their sacred scriptures and then would recite those sacred scriptures as with, with clarity and with, uh, with focus and concentration. And, you know, when you hear that description, that's close to a description of meditation. I mean, it's not exactly the same because they're memorizing scriptures, but it's not that different from meditation. And in fact, when we meditate, actually, we often use parts of ancient scriptures to meditate with. For example, in Thailand, they uh, will meditate using the uh, phrase buddho. So they'll say buddho, buddho. This actually is just taken from the, the chant on the recollection of the, the Buddha's qualities, the buddha guna uh, anusati. So that idea that we are recollecting, we are recollecting the past is not so different from that quality of being in the present. So what this doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't mean being lost in the past. It doesn't mean just sort of uh, mindlessly reminiscing, but it means being conscious of that flow. And I think this is the important thing. The Buddha talked about the, the present awareness of mindfulness. He used the word anupasi. And the word anupasi has this idea of this connection the anu means connected, means flowing, it means along with. So it doesn't just mean watching, it means continuing to watch. Yeah? And so that idea of continuity also, like keeping something in mind. And I think this is where that memory aspects come in. It's memory that's stitching the past, the present, and the future together. And that continuity of flow is what is what stops our mind from being scattered all over the place. We have our mind is not atomic. It's not just a, um, uh, the flow of our mind is not like grains of sand. It's like water. Yeah? And it has that continuity to it. And this is where mindfulness comes in. Now, in the, in the Bojangas themselves, the sati is explained and can be understood in both of those ways. So that the sati partly means that when you're listening to a Dhamma talk, like right now, then you will recall and recollect what was said in that Dhamma talk. This is one of the great qualities that the Buddha recommended. And we know that that they would do that. That's why we've got the Tipitaka, because Venerable Ananda, and of course he wasn't alone, he was the, the greatest of those who would remember the, the suttas, but he wasn't the only one. That was a normal part of the practice, that you would be able to recollect what was going on in the suttas. And of course the Buddha designed his teachings so that they could be remembered through using repetition and formal structures, similes and so on. And the suttas are absolutely chock full of all of these methods for making them memorable. So this is something that's really important and really useful to do. How do we do that? What's the way to make things memorable? Well, first of all, uh, uh, part of that's the job of a teacher. And so a teacher should try to make it clear and they should try to uh, introduce some, uh, especially repetition. So if I'm going to teach on the seven bojangas, I should teach mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, rapture, tranquility, samadhi, and equanimity. And I should say these things over and over again so that you can help to remember them. But memory needs to be an active process. For me, the most effective way to be able to memorize things from a talk is simply to every few minutes in the talk, maybe every five minutes or 10 minutes or so, to just check back in with yourself and remind yourself what has been said previously in the talk. Okay, started with that, talked about that, talked about that, talked about that, okay? And you make four or five mental notes of what was talked about. Then five or 10 minutes later, do the same thing again. 
check back what was just said in the last five to 10 minutes and the previous ones and keep reminding yourself of those mental notes. A bit like you can, you, obviously some people like to take down the physical notes and that's fine if you like to do it that way. Um, but you can also learn just the, the practice of doing it mentally. And that's a very, very powerful tool. What, what the, 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 the thing about memory is that memory, uh, memory is fairly easy to reinforce when it's fresh because the pathways are still alight. The pathways in your brain are still alight and you can remind yourself of those things. And if you leave even like 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, then they start to go cold. And if you get to the end of the Dhamma talk and you try to remember the whole talk, it's too much. But if after five minutes you say, okay, what happened in the last five minutes, it's enough. And then even just to reinforce that two or three times will increase your retentiveness a lot. And so this is, this is a, really important, a really important, useful technique for uh, learning the Dhamma. It's also something that I teach to, to school kids and to students uh, when I teach them about mindful learning and mindful education. Take mental notes, remind yourself and have that sense of active listening. And I always say for the school kids that if you can do that, then you don't have to spend so much time doing homework. <laughs> More active, active listening, active engaging. Get it in there. And once it's in there, it's there. You don't have to, you don't have to like do it a thousand times, but just enough so that you can remember it. Another really important thing about memory and being able to remember things is connected with the next one of the Bojangas is Dhamma Vichaya, is investigation of Dhammas. So Dhamma Vichaya once more relates both to both aspects, both the present awareness and to the uh, listening to teaching. So we can, uh, we can interpret Dhamma in this case in both of those ways. Dhamma can mean the phenomena of reality, the principles of reality, the truths that we're talking about, and it can also mean the teachings, the texts, the scriptures that are just that are describing those tr truths. Actually, in the suttas, of course, you find dhammas used in a wide variety of ways. Uh, but when I was translating, one of the things that I, I learned as I was translating was that in most cases, uh, you can translate dhammas as teachings by default. Even in cases sometimes where you think, if it's a case where you, you're not quite sure what the meaning of dhammas is, then you think, well, it could mean teachings or it could mean truths or realities or phenomena here. Then more often than not, if you assume that it's teachings, later on you'll find out actually that's really what it does mean because there was some other context that clarified it. I was kind of a bit surprised by that. I thought that it would be a bit more evenly spread among the different meanings. But most commonly, dhammas in the suttas means the teachings, especially the teachings of the Buddha. Anyway, that's a bit of a side note. So here, as always, the Buddha is uh, asking us to investigate these teachings. So the Buddha was not just about memorizing. He didn't want us to just... Uh, learn things by rote. He wanted us to question. He wanted us to inquire. He wanted us to scrutinize. And in fact, the suttas are telling us this constantly. Every, it seems like every second sutta is telling us. And the one of the challenges in Pali, like if we is the, is the extensive vocabulary of words that describe the investigation into Dhamma. And it's difficult in English because we don't have so many words. We can say investigate, reflect, inquire, examine, scrutinize. That's already quite a few words there. But in Pali, there's a lot more. And trying to capture all of the nuances of those different terms is not easy. It's a bit like the uh, Eskimos and snow. And, you know, they have so many words for snow. The Buddha had so many words for investigating with wisdom because it was such a uh, such a powerful concept for him. I should, I should clarify, actually, that, that I'm not sure if that's correct about Eskimos and so, snow. Some people say that they don't actually have so many words for snow, but I don't know. I do think, I did read recently the Sami in uh, the indigenous people in Norway. They do have many words for snow. And one of the things that they're finding is that now their words for snow, are there are new kinds of snow because of climate change. And even though they've got a hundred words for snow, they still don't have enough. 
because they're encountering new kinds of snow. Anyway, a bit beside the point, moving on. So investigation of the teachings. So this also, so this helps our wisdom to grow, but also helps us to remember it because we understand the links between things. We understand the connections between them. And so when, when we're listening, investigate, inquire, and make sure you understand the meaning. Now, if you don't understand the meaning of something, again, that's something to make a note, a physical note or a mental note, and clarify it later. Sometimes when you're teaching, sometimes you will uh, make some kind of logical leap that other people can't follow. Sometimes you make a reference, people don't, don't get it. Sometimes you assume some background knowledge uh, and people don't have that background knowledge. And so we make all of these assumptions when we're talking about the Dhamma. And so we need you as Dhamma teachers. It's really helpful for us if you can then ask us, well, what does this mean? Then, ah, okay, thank you. Now, now I can know what needs explaining and what doesn't need explaining. So please don't feel uh, backwards in coming forward to ask about things. Okay, so uh, memory and investigation of dhammas. So when we're listening to dhammas, listening to teachings or reading a dhamma book, we have an active process of uh, reminding ourselves, memorizing, trying to, get it, uh, uh, trying to get it to stick in our mind and inquiring as to the meaning of it understanding the way things fit together, the relationship between the different parts, what the meaning is of the thing as a whole. So this is, this is those first two factors when it's looked at in terms of the teaching. Now we can also understand those first two factors in terms of uh, the experience and especially meditative experience. So when we're meditating, the same thing. So here, sati means uh, present awareness, and in particular, the continuity of awareness, to keep on watching. It says in the commentary, anu anupasati, one keeps on watching, anu anupasati. So you keep on watching, you keep on watching. Now, that already is a, a mode of awareness that goes against the grain of much of what we're trained to do or much of what our conditioning is. We are conditioned for our mind to be scattered, to go look here, to look there, to lose attention, to have our train of thought interrupted, to... And you see, see, see what that means. Just, just think about psychologically what that means in terms of your mind. What that means is that your mind is being pulled apart your mind is being pulled apart to the past, the present, and the future. Your mind is being pulled apart to the six senses. Your mind is being pulled apart through the various hindrances and defilements that you have. Your mind is being pulled apart through your emotions, through your thoughts, through your fears, through your desires. And each of these are leading your mind in different directions. And you can be hopping all over the place. All of the different moods, all of the different fears, everything that's going on. And, that's, and that, of course, is what we call stress. It's not pleasant. Yeah. It manifests as a sense of unease. So by knitting... Excuse me, Bhante. Excuse yes. me, Bhante. I think yeah. the, sun, the sun behind, I think, uh, I don't know whether that's affecting your image. Uh, I don't know if I can do the the blinds are closed already, so I don't know if I can do much about it. To be honest, right, right. sorry oh, about that. No, that's all right. <laughs> this is Australia. We have we have sunshine here. That must be his halo. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, Just but, uh, Australian, if, uh, Australian sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> So, but they can move a little towards the pillar side, then I think maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they can minimize yeah, it a little better. bit. Is that better? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah all right. All right. So, um, okay. So, uh, where were we? Yes. Continuity, knitting your mind together and creating a wholeness in your mind, right? Right from the beginning. Right? Mindfulness. So then think about what that means in meditation when you're watching your breath. 
Anapanasati, mindfulness of your breathing, breathing coming in, breathing going out. It means keeping your awareness there, keeping watching, keeping your awareness there, keeping watching. And your mind goes here, goes there, goes all over the place, and we keep it here, and we keep that awareness there. And that is the mindfulness in the present. It's knitting together time and space into a single continuity, healing the fractures and the divisions in your mind and creating unity where there before was division. Now, one of the things that that does is that that give because because our mind is more unified so i want you to follow my follow my logic here yeah? so because the mind is unified huh? then that means that it's easy to trace back because we have a single path to trace back and we can watch the changes and uh, alterations of our mind over time and this is where the Dhamma Vichaya starts to come in. So we can start to investigate and to reflect, how is our mind? How does it work? Why is mindfulness having this effect? What is it that is changing? What is it that's staying the same? You know, how are things affecting each other? And these, this, this Dhamma Vichaya is really effectively the same as uh, say in Satipatthana, they call Dhammanupasana, and it's really the same kind of practice as there. So this is how these two things can relate to each other, Sati and Dhammavichaya, having both of them having these two dimensions, first of all, in terms of the teaching, recollecting the teaching and inquiring and investigating the teaching, and also uh, in terms of meditation keeping the mind mindful and reflecting and investigating on the meditation and on the state of the mind and the phenomena that you're experiencing during the meditation. So these two dimensions are present throughout, especially these first two factors. Now, the third, the next factor is energy, right? So, you know, we've seen that there's a close uh, a close connection between the ideas of sati and dhamma vichaya that the one of one leads to the next uh, and that's true if, if perhaps not as tightly linked but it's also true for virya uh, and energy now so what does energy mean in buddhism well uh, we can understand energy from many different aspects but one of the things to remember in buddhism is that uh, in buddhism as in modern science uh, everything is energy. And Einstein said E equals MC squared. That means that matter is energy. And matter is nothing really more than super dense energy. And that means that everything all the time is made of energy. And the Buddha basically said the same thing. Like he, he said that everything is made of sankharas. In other words, sankhara. Uh, you know, we usually translate it as conditions or something, but we can also translate it as energies. So the whole, whole world is made of energies. Now, that has some interesting consequences because uh, much of our, much of our uh, world, uh, in, in the material world, we think that energy is scarce. Right? Just think about that. Think about how, you know, in our politics, our econ economies and so on, how much effort is spent around energy, right? Getting oil, getting coal, renewable energy, all of these things. Because, and all of that's predicated on the assumption that energy is scarce. From a, from a point of view of physics, actually, energy isn't scarce at all. Literally everything in the universe is made of energy. And you, you can have more than enough energy to power the entire planet. You can make out of anything just by converting the mass into energy. But the problem is not that there's not energy. The problem is useful energy, you know, available energy, effective energy. So the same thing is true for our mind. Actually, our minds are made of energy. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, I've run out of energy. There's nothing else... Your mind is nothing but energy. 
And the problem is that we can't always access it. Right? The problem is we don't always have available energy. We don't always have effective energy. Now, that is from a combination of reasons, partly physical, obviously. Uh, and, you know, those the physical aspects of lack of energy are fairly, fairly, for most of the time, fairly straightforward. But the Buddha was more interested in the psychological aspects of lack of energy. Why, why do we feel like we don't have energy? And that's something that can easily become uh, a more prominent for us in the, this time of pandemic. I mean, you know, a lot of us are spending a lot more time sort of trapped inside, not, not, not getting out so much, not doing so much uh, exercise, maybe, maybe uh, not, not uh, seeing our friends so much, not doing so many events or something like that. And it's easy to find that your energy or your enthusiasm can slip away. Slip away. Uh, it can turn into depression. And, you know, for, for many people, uh, depression doesn't manifest so much as sadness. It can, can be part of the experience of sadness as well, but it can also manifest a lot as a lack of energy. And people who are uh, severely <laughs> depressed uh, find that they're so lacking in mental energy that they can't even, they struggle to like, get out of bed or go to the toilet or something like that. It just doesn't seem to be worth it. And just to even accomplish just an ordinary everyday task becomes something that's huge. And so I think that, that during this time uh, of pandemic and this time of lockdown, that it's really easy to let these tendencies grow. Uh, and so I think it's, it's important for us to watch out both within ourselves and also with our family and friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, our relatives and look out for each other and take care of each other. And as Dhamma practitioners, we should, uh, uh, we should be aware of the fact that we can take care of our own mental health. But the starting point to that is to have some energy, <laughs> to make some effort. And we can do some practical things to do that, uh, we can set a routine, we can make a, um, uh, we can uh, support each other through a community, through our friends, we can uh, have like regular Dhamma groups and Dhamma sessions that we're going to have. Uh, we can set, it, set ourselves goals in terms of doing like a regular meditation practice, for example. Uh, and so there are many things that we can do to uh, uh, amp up our energy and to strengthen uh, our resolve. And practice <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you so much okay. Deepa. <laughs> okay fine okay yeah uh yeah so uh but the most important thing the most important aspect of the quality of energy is very simple and this is a, a quality that i learned from uh samwise gamji on the road to mount doom and Samwise, for those fellow fans of the Lord of the Rings, was the true hero of the Lord of the Rings. And even though Frodo was bearing the ring for most of the way, it was Sam who really made it possible for him to get there. And when they were traveling, uh, they had a conversation. And, you know, I read this book so many times when I was a kid, you know, and but it's a long time ago now. And, you know, you forget most of the things there, but there's one conversation that really struck with me. And they were talking and they said, uh, Frodo said, oh, I wonder if anybody will remember what we did. And the, the, all the hardships we endured, all the efforts that we've made to try to save the world. And Sam pointed out that uh, they, only, they, only, they only sing songs about the ones who didn't give up that that's really all it takes to be a hero. The real meaning of a hero is somebody who doesn't give up. So the word virya actually is from the word vira, which means a hero. So this is what we're practicing. We're practicing virya, we're practicing heroism. And the defining quality of a hero, they don't give up. 
it doesn't matter how advanced you are in your path. It doesn't really matter even how quickly you're progressing. It doesn't matter too much if you've got, you know, this meditation method or that meditation method. It doesn't, none of these things are all details. Like they can, they can help you a little bit. Yes. But the most important thing, just don't give up. Just don't give up. And if we are on the path, no matter how long the path seems to be, one step, that's all it takes. <laughs> one step forward. <laughs> don't get lost and wander off the path. Don't fall back on the path and don't lie down there and go to sleep. No matter how hard it is, no matter how impossible it is, no matter how much you think, there's so long to go, just one more inch, and you're heading in the right direction. That's what energy is. Energy is to not give up. Now, of course, for the Buddha, the energy was primarily the mental energy, the energy to overcome unwholesome, unskillful qualities, to develop skillful qualities, and importantly, to persist them and maintain them. So these also, all, all these things require energy. But also note that they emerge out of mindfulness and investigation of phenomena. So in order to understand what is kusala and what is akusala, what is skillful, what is unskillful, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, then we need our mindfulness to be, have the awareness of what's going on and we need our investigation to understand and to discriminate between what's good and what's bad. And that allows us to make the right effort. So one of the things that I see a lot in Buddhist circles is people making a lot of effort, but not necessarily making right effort. And sometimes it's easy to spend a lot of time in meditation or to, to go to many retreats and to do all of these things. And it's not, that, it's not that that's a bad thing to do, but sometimes it can be a bit like kind of pushing uh, and it's being driven by restlessness and fear rather than sort of allowing the flow of the Dhamma to take place. I always remember this uh, a story somebody said many years ago when I was a young monk. Actually, it was Ajahn Pasano who said this story. And this is from the Christian desert fathers who were kind of an ascetic order of contemplatives who lived in the early Christian days uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, somebody, one of the uh, young monks came to the abbot of the monastery and said, uh, uh, and said uh, uh, Bhante, he probably didn't say Bhante, but I'm just trying to think what they would say, father, maybe he would say, uh, <laughs> I want to, he said, I want to do a practice. He said, I want to just eat one loaf of bread every second day. And the abbot sort of listened to him. He said, oh, okay. Hmm. Thought about it for a while. He said, well, you would make me happier if you had half a loaf of bread every day. Now, this is the kind of thing that I mean, yeah? You know? A persistent, gentle, normal effort is what really matters, not anything spectacular, not really pushing. And remember that when you hear these stories, and you do hear these stories of people, you know, in the Teragata, Terigata, and other places where they, you know, meditate for many days or something like that. And of course, that's, that's when they're at a certain point in their spiritual journey. You know, like, like the Bodhisattva sat all night under the Bodhi tree. And that was when he had reached that point in his journey. And that was the time for him to do that. But that doesn't mean that just for everybody, that if you just push harder, that you'll go harder. So we make that effort, but we make a balanced and sustainable and even effort. Yeah. So this is the uh, energy. Now, one of the things about uh, making an effort is that it feels good. I don't know about you, but when I get lazy, it doesn't feel good. I mean, okay, it maybe feels good for a little while, right? <laughs> you can, if you sleep in or, you know, just take it easy or just sort of, you know, it's all right. It's all right to relax and so on for a while, but it doesn't take long before oh, it's not, it doesn't feel nice, right? 
if you've if you've been overworked and overexhausted, sure you need that rest but to be lazy doesn't feel good what feels good is doing something making an effort achieving something getting it done and so the next uh, factor in the bojangas is joy rapture beauty and beauty is one of the most interesting uh, qualities we find beauty is um pity is uh, well, best known as one of the jhana factors. But of course, you know, because piti is one of the factors in jhana, but it doesn't mean that all piti is jhana. It's a mistake that some people make that they think, oh, if they're experiencing some piti, that therefore they must be in jhana. No, so it doesn't work like that. As here, piti is one of the factors that leads to jhanas. So jhanas occurs when you have multiple different factors, all of which are present, all of which are in balance. Uh, and all of which are working together in just the right way. Right? So, but we experience different kinds of piti long before we might get into a jhana state. And the essence of the idea of piti is that piti is some kind of uh, emotional reaction or response. It can be uh, a negative response, right? So you can have like a sensual piti, a sensual rapture. But that is much less often in the sort of most of the times when it talks about PT, it talks about it in a positive sense, a spiritual sense. And so we can think of PT as being, in a sense, like the mind leaping up towards something wholesome, a sense of excitement, a sense of joy. We can, it manifests often as hair raising on your skin. It can manifest as goosebumps. It can manifest as like a shiver down through your spine. It can manifest as tears coming into your eyes. Uh, it can manifest as breaking out into laughter when you're sitting in a meditation hall with a bunch of people and you sit there and just start laughing. And everyone thinks you're a bit nuts. Don't worry, it's normal. It can manifest the other way, also just breaking out in tears. Sometimes it manifests as a unusual, like physical sensation. Like you can feel like your body is expanding. Like you, you're becoming like the Michelin man. You feel like you're taking up much more space. Or you feel like you're, you, sometimes you feel like your, your body has become a rock. You feel like you've become just so heavy and solid, but not heavy in a, um, not heavy in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad way, but just like immovable. And you feel this kind of sense of solidity and massiveness to yourself. Or it can be the opposite. Sometimes you feel like your, your body has become extremely light and you're floating up from your seat. And sometimes in meditation, you, you really feel like you're actually floating up in the air. And it's recommended that if you think that you're floating up in the air when you're meditating, don't open your eyes. Because if you're really meditate, if you're really up in the air, you don't want to like <laughs> crash down and land on the on the seat again. So just just keep your eyes shut, okay? So all of these uh, and many more are uh, the different manifestations of the kinds of PT or kinds of rapture that you can. Uh, experience. In the, the Wasudi Magga has a nice discussion of these and it uh, identifies five different kinds of uh, piti or five different kinds of rapture and gives various examples of these. But none of these are the important one. Right? These are all uh, symptoms or experiences that you may or may not have in your path of meditation. Not everybody will experience these things and surely everyone will experience them in different ways. So don't worry if you have or have not these things. The reason, that's, that's really the reason why we mentioned them is just because they are experiences. So often people will have these things, they don't know what's going on. So it's just important to know, oh, that's what this is. So just keep meditating. Don't worry about it too much. The rapture that is important is what's called paranapiti or pervasive rapture. And so that's a rapture that soaks through your whole body and gives a gentle feeling of like uplift, almost like a sense of sparkliness or bubbliness, a sense of joy and uh, um, like, a, like a kind of subtle tingle or zing 
in your experience. It's a slightly uplifting thing, but very kind of gentle. And you can feel this through your whole body. And so the Parana PT is much more stable than those previous manifestations of PT. Those previous ones will come and go just a, you know, a few seconds or a few minutes. The Parana PT can last for hours on end. And so sometimes when, uh, when you're developing the meditation, that Parana PT will be excessive right and and it and that that excess is caused is due to uh, uh, an imbalanced emotional response to your meditation so what happens is that um if you have like uh, 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 suffering anxiety stress and all of these things which is kind of you know we carry within us and we're largely unconscious of these things much of the time and very often what happens is that we come to dhamma we come to spiritual practice we come to meditation because actually we 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 suspect or we intuit that there is this suffering that we're carrying around inside us and yet we're kind of afraid of that suffering and we don't quite understand it we don't quite want to look at it too closely sometimes maybe we understand it all too well and it's been part of our lives for too long, and we just want to get rid of it. And so we come to spiritual practice in a way because it promises us a path forward out of that suffering. And then when, when that door is opened, and that door of joy is opened, <laughs> we leap towards it. Oh, my goodness, it's true. It's really true. I can remember this when I first started experiencing rapture when I was, when I was doing metta meditation. It was when I was in Anagarika staying in the, in the forest in Thailand. And uh, doing metta meditation is one of the great and powerful ways of experiencing rapture. You get this, this sense of love and joy and it comes up. And when it first started happening in meditation, I was like, oh my God, it's, it's real. <laughs> These things that, the, that they talk about, this sense of joy and uplift and that freedom, it's actually real. It's not, just, it's not just something in a book. It's something that actually happens. And it happens, it happens to me. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was something that happened to other people. But no, 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 it actually happens to me as well. And so this is, this is where the mind becomes very excited by this, leaps towards it. It gets this sense of thrill. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, very, it's a normal part of that path, but it's not very peaceful. So this is where we have to shift and move that rapture towards the next factor, which is the pasadhi or tranquility. Pasadhi also a factor uh, in jhanas, a factor leading towards jhanas in the suttas. Pasadhi and sukha are very close in sense. Uh, sukha in this context, pleasure or bliss. So pasadhi has that sense of settledness that sense of ease, that sense of... Yeah. And Pasadhi brings balance and it brings quiet and it brings calm. Yeah. And so now, once we are here, uh, we have put into place many of the factors of jhanas. We have the energy, we have the mindfulness, we have the rapture, we have the tranquility and so on and so forth. So little bit by little bit as we're going, we're establishing the causes and conditions for the experience of samadhi or of uh, uh, deep meditation or jhanas or however you want to call it. And then that's the next factor. Now, uh, when the Buddha was talking about uh, samadhi in the suttas, uh, especially when samadhi is used in a significant doctrinal context, uh, such as the seven awakening factors, then it invariably means the four jhanas. Uh, the word samadhi used more generally in the suttas occasionally has a slightly wider meaning. So sometimes, uh, you know, in a very few cases, the word samadhi is used for like a state of mind before jhanas. 
or it's used for various kinds of exotic attainments of enlightened beings uh, after uh, enlightenment or something like that. But, or, but most of the time, and especially when talking about the fundamental practices of the path, when the Buddha is using the word samadhi, then it's always explained as being the four jhanas. So uh, what is happening here is that all of these qualities which we've been developing are all coming into focus. They are all supporting each other. They're all in balance. And so the mind is becoming unified. Now, the, the idea of samadhi is always associated with the idea of oneness and unity. And that oneness is a deep oneness. And by deep oneness, what I mean is that... Um, it manifests in multiple dimensions simultaneously. For example, it means oneness in time. Right? Unification means oneness in time. Think about it. Time is our experience of change. We only know time is passing because we look at a clock and the hand is moving from one thing to another thing. It's change that tells us that time is passing. In samadhi, nothing is changing. It's a still point. And so the experience of time is suspended. So somebody who is looking at someone who's practicing a jhana can say, well, they've been sitting there for an hour, they've been sitting there for two hours or something like that. But to the person in that state, there's no such thing as time. Time is suspended. And so this is the one-pointedness in time. There's also like a one-pointedness in terms of the object of your meditation, that you are you're focused on the mind is aware of one thing and it's not aware of anything else. It's also unified in terms of the consciousness. So normally, normal sense experience, uh, and this is something the Buddha emphasized again and again, normal sense experience is stressful and suffering because it's diverse, because we're experiencing all of these six senses. And the Buddha talked about the, the Chapana Sutta, about how the, the, the six senses are like six animals. And, you know, imagine you get like a bird and a crocodile and a dog and a jackal and a monkey, and you tie them all up and leave them in a bundle on the street. And they're all kicking and pulling in different directions. That's what happens when you have many different kinds of consciousness. In samadhi or jhana, you only have one kind of consciousness, is mind consciousness. So it's peaceful. It's not all of these different kinds of consciousness striving against each other. So this is what I mean when I talk about jhana or samadhi as being a deep experience of unity. It's an experience where the unification of the mind manifests in these multiple different ways all at the same time and the balance and harmony of all of those factors that have led to that is what creates the strength and the power of mind that will lead to that kind of experience now no matter how powerful the experience of jhana is no matter how transformative uh, it is still a conditioned phenomena. It still arises because of all of these factors which we've developed on the way to the jhana. And because it's conditioned, it's impermanent. And because it's impermanent, it's also dukkha. It's also suffering. It's not good enough. I mean, it's okay. It's better than okay. It's pretty great, actually. But it's still is not the ending of suffering. And so eventually that experience comes to an end. Now, through the practice of jhanas, the uh, deepening of the jhanic experience leads to the fourth jhana, where, which is characterized by equanimity. And equanimity is one of these mental qualities which is always placed uh, at the end of something. So in, say, the Brahma Viharas, for example, equanimity is always the last of the Brahma Viharas. And so it is here that equanimity is what comes out after all of these things. Now, the word equanimity, Pali word is upeka. Upeka literally means closely watching. Closely watching, closely watching over something. Upa is near to. Ika is to watch. So upeka doesn't mean indifference. It doesn't mean not caring. 
It means closely watching over something. And the difference is, uh, if, is the difference that you would want in a court case. If you're in a court case, you want your judge to be, uh, uh, to be disinterested, but you don't want your judge to be uninterested. Understand the difference? A, a disinterested judge is one who's not favoring and opposing. They're not biased towards one side or the other. But an uninterested judge is one who's falling asleep and bored. So you want your judge to be disinterested, but not uninterested. And this is why Ubeka comes at the end of all of these qualities. If we, if we overly develop Ubeka too early on in our practice, then the tendency will that it will fall on that side of being uninterested. It will tend to lead towards boredom. It will tend to lead towards indifference. It will tend to lead towards a lack of compassion. It will tend to lead towards making an excuse to not do anything because it will upset me. Yeah, and this is something we find a lot in the Buddhist tradition. Oh, I don't want to get involved because I want to look after my own mind state. This is micha upeka. This is wrong upeka. And this is why real upeka, deep upeka, deep equanimity comes at the end of all of these things. When our mind is stable and contented, when we can look at suffering in ourselves without blanching, without turning aside, when we can look at the suffering in others and respond with compassion and with wisdom. So equanimity is what is the, the emotional quality that allows all of these previous factors to work together and to fruit in wisdom and in letting go and in freedom. So equanimity, on the one hand, is an emotional quality, which is the outcome of the jhanas, the fourth jhana and the arupas, as well as the brahma viharas. But it's also the foundation for vipassana, the foundation for the investigation in wisdom and understanding. And this is where the dhamma and the mindfulness, which we developed right at the start of these bojangas, now is starting to bear fruit. Previously, we were reflecting on the teachings, reflecting on the meaning of the teachings, investigating them, or we were looking at our own phenomena, we're looking at our own mind, our own thoughts and likes and dislikes and reflecting on those things, yeah? and gaining wisdom and understanding little bit by little bit by those means. But now, now that our mind has been purified and empowered through the practice of samadhi, and now that we have the balance and the calm offered by equanimity, we can see those things directly, without looking aside, without excuses, without uh, shaping that experience through our own, uh, our own preferences, our own conceits, our own desires. We can just see them as they are. And this is the gift that equanimity gives us. So equanimity as the last one of the awakening factors is the factor that leads directly towards the experience of enlightenment. So this is a few words for you uh, today on the seven awakening factors, the seven bodhangas, mindfulness, investigation of phenomena, energy, rapture, tranquility, samadhi, equanimity. Hopefully you can remember them now. If you, could, if you didn't know them all at the beginning. Uh, so I, I might hand it back to you, Lakshman, if you have any questions or if you want any comments from the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Bhante. I think uh, uh, really explained the seven, seven awakening factors or Bhujanga. And uh, I think the most important thing was the, the real practical aspects that were given to all our uh, Dhamma devotees. And uh, I really made a note of one particular matter because all this time uh, we were looking to see how we can attract the younger, uh, maybe the, the youth and maybe the kids. So Bhante mentioned this, that uh, I think uh, the memory, uh, if we can really use that uh, memory where we can tell them as to how they can improve their learning yeah. abilities, how they can pass exams with the memory. Yep. I yep. think uh, very many more we can attract them because 
at the moment we are we should identify an area that uh, will really attract the uh, the youth uh, and the poor kids i i was told that bante is doing that maybe bante can explain a little uh, uh, maybe uh, after this uh, but i we have also venerable uh, volande anand thero i think uh, first of all let me uh, Welcome, Venerable Olande Anand Thero, because I'm very thankful and for Venerable uh, Olande Anand Thero. So uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, Venerable Thero, you are having some very valuable comments uh, or any uh, any other ideas which uh, we would like to hear. Well, that may be uh, your um, expectation and your uh, illusion about me. Uh, that <laughs> all the questions and all the comments that I think uh, Venerable Sujata has given a, an all-encompassing uh, talk, which has uh, covered sort of yeah, just about uh, all the different points. It's nothing really that I could add to it. And uh, you have a very uh, interesting style of uh, mixing your own experience and the day-to-day -day kind of uh, events also and examples um, with the uh, knowledge of the Dhamma, and not only Buddhism, but also in the Brahmanistic uh, um, tradition and things like that. So um, it's, um, thank you very much. Uh, there are about uh, 80 participants, I'm not the only one. Um, thank you very much. For sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you so very much, Venerable. Uh, thank you, uh... Uh, Deepal, I think, uh, uh, would you like to make a few comments, uh, Deepal? Uh, yeah, as uh, always, it is very uh, enlightening and uh, thought-provoking to listen to you, Abhante. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, clarify a little bit. Uh, now, when you say virya, effort yeah uh, you uh, said two points one is uh, through sati we try to uh, we uh, what is intended is to keep the mind in the net so that you don't lose uh, the so to say the trail of uh, thoughts you know from right. the morning up to now where have i been <laughs> right, right? right and secondly is the effort is to distinguish uh, from good and the bad, and then uh, to make an effort uh, to accept if something is wrong uh, right, right. or to uh, do something uh, better. Is that what you mean by effort there, Monty? Uh, that's right. Although the, the distinguishing part really would be the Dhamma Vichaya. So the Dhamma Vichaya is distinguishing the good and bad, and then the effort, the Wiriya is making the effort to abandon yeah. the bad and, and develop the good. And the way that you explain, this looks like uh, these things flows from one to the other. One to the other. It's like a continual, yeah. uh, it linked. And uh, yeah. especially when you say that the Pekka comes at the end. Right. I, I got the feeling that as you advance, the degree, or the quality of Pekka also improves uh, with your understanding. I, I missed that last part. Can you just repeat that last sentence, Deepa? Uh, the the upeka, the way you described, uh, the, I, if I got my understanding right, uh, it is not just indifference, but it's a degree of indifference, uh, and it matures as your uh, understanding of the true nature increases. Is is oh. that the right way to understand? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't use the word indifference for uh, equanimity, uh, uh, for upeka, uh, equanimity, or um, I, I was flirting with using something like, um, what was I thinking for upeka? Like the literal meaning is to closely watch something. Right? But it's not, but, but it's watching over something, but without, in, in a way, in a way, uh, being, being ready to respond. Right? To be being indifferent is to, to, yeah, to be indifferent is to say, I don't care what happens. Right? Whereas equanimity is like, okay. I mean, the example the Buddha gives in the suttas is the example of smelting gold. So you're smelting gold and then sometimes you need to heat the flames up. 
sometimes you need to cool it down. And then mm -hmm. sometimes if everything's going good, then you just watch it. And any cook knows this. Huh? <laughs> sometimes you turn the heat up, sometimes down. Sometimes you just watch, but mm -hmm. being watching just doesn't mean that you just wander off and you don't care about it anymore, but it means that you're ready to step in if need be. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Uh, I think Bhante, there are a few questions you like. Yeah. To... Uh, yeah, shall I take the questions in the Q&A? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so first one from Shirani. How's it going, Shirini? I hope you're going well, and I hope that uh, you are coping okay with all of our pandemic and everything else that's going on. And I know that it's it's uh, it difficult for all of us, so I hope you're doing well. Anyway, uh, are the Bojanga factors mainly connected with meditation? Can they also be used in day-to-day -day activities? Well, yes, I would agree that they're mainly, mainly talking about meditation. Now, obviously in Buddhism, uh, you know, we can apply thing. You, obviously, you can apply anything to anything if you like, because it's just the mind, right? I mean, when you meditate, it's not it's not like something different. It's just it's just the same mind, but you're doing everything else with it. So, of course, it's not completely different. But the main focus in the awakening factors very much is the practice of meditation and the application to spiritual factors. One of the things that I'm, you know, I mentioned before about how I have kind of reservations about how we like to turn everything into mindful this and mindful that. Uh, and then we have, you know, we have this kind of thing of mindfulness in daily life and all of these kinds of things. And I feel that on the one hand, of course, sure, be mindful, put mindfulness, everything, no worries. But I feel that there's, it's kind of that, that that's kind of masking a rather more subtle shift which is that these days we talk about applying mindfulness to daily life, whereas the Buddha talked about applying our daily life to mindfulness. Do you see the difference? The difference is that we, we actually do different things because they are unmindful things to do. It doesn't mean that we just do the same things and try to be mindful while we do them. But I mean, sometimes that, that's the case, of course, right? But sometimes it might also be the case that being mindful means not doing that thing or doing something else. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, a, a simple example might be, uh, say, uh, you know, having care for the environment. You might say, use a lot of plastic in your home. And you can say, well, I'm going to use this plastic, you know, wrap my food in three layers of plastic and put it in a plastic box and then wrap it in another piece of plastic. And I'm going to be mindful while I'm doing that. <laughs> well, my mindfulness would be to say, I'm not going to use the plastic or I'm going to use it as little as possible. So mindfulness actually is changing how we're doing things. It's not just something that is added to what we're doing things. So in uh, our... Um, uh, meditation, we can take these foundations that we're building up and we are creating something new. Remember that when the Buddha was talking about practicing in daily life, he was mainly talking about sila. That's his practice in daily life. And that's the most important thing to focus on. Anyway, moving on. So, Aikonika, uh, how are you today, dear Venerable? I hope things are going well up at Santi. It's a nice hot day, so it's probably uh, uh, probably nice up there. It's always like 10 degrees cooler up in the highlands compared to down here in Sydney. Uh, so what's the connection between Manasikara and Sati? Hmm. Well, oh, yes. Well, I, I mean, um, it's a kind of question which could, could take a, a long answer, but the brief answer would be that Manasikara is similar in meaning to Dhammavichaya which is the second factor, uh, which we talked about in the Bojangas. Not necessarily identical. And as I mentioned before, there are many terms for this aspect of investigation, inquiry, reflection. They each have a slightly different meaning. So Manasikara maybe has a slightly different sense to Dhamma Vichaya, but generally speaking, a similar kind of idea. So then that would 
to have a similar role there, that, that Sati is then supported the Manasi Kara. Okay, so Cyril is asking, how, how's it going, Cyril? I hope you are doing well. Uh, how would jhana help for enlightenment? How jhana helps for enlightenment by clarifying the mind of hindrances, allowing the mind to see with uh, a brilliance of and precision and stabilizing our focus on insight into wisdom. Jhana helps enlightenment because we see through our own experience that letting go leads to happiness. That's what, that's what jhanas are. Jhanas are the experience of letting go. And if we let go of the five hindrances, it leads to that profound and brilliant sense of happiness that we call jhanas. And if we let go of our root defilements, the akusala mula, then that will lead to the even more brilliant stability and happiness of awakening or enlightenment. Okay, Anoja, good, uh, good uh, morning or evening, uh, Anoja. I hope you are doing well. In the current world of being bombarded with negative news, is it incorrect to turn away from this bombardment? Well, I think, I think, I think moderate it, you know? I mean, don't, don't you know, certainly we get too obsessed you know, I, I, would, I would personally recommend uh, don't get your news from social media. Social media is designed to make you addicted and has been shown again and again to have serious mental health consequences. So if you want to use social media to keep in touch with your friends and share, you know, puppy photographs and so on, fine. But I would recommend... Uh, find a, a few reliable sources of information of news media and get your news from them and you know and that's enough you know for myself usually I read the Guardian so we have an Australian edition of the Guardian so they have enough local news and I usually read that for like you know 10 20 minutes in the morning to sort of catch up on what's happening and that's my kind of main source of news uh, and you know just find a good quality read not no source of news is perfect right we know that it's all right we don't expect people to be perfect but one that's reasonably good and then don't get obsessed about having to follow everything you don't have to watch every edition of the evening news you know you don't have to have all of these kinds of things just enough uh, and so just just look after yourself but i do think that it's important See, if, 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 we, if, we, if we live in a bubble where we are completely isolated from these events, then that's, that's fear talking. That's, that's us being afraid that we can't cope. So have the courage uh, and the confidence that we can cope. Uh, and look, I know, and I know that this is, this, is a, this is a serious issue. And, you know, it's not just you who's experiencing that. One of the things I do here in Australia, I, I work with... Uh, the staff and scientists at our, our scientific body, CSIRO, and uh, recently when they had the, um, the COP26 meeting on climate change, and uh, you know when I met with some of my friends from that, and then I said, "Oh, what, what, what did you think? You know, what was your impression of the proceedings there?" And then one of the scientists said, "Oh, look, it's too depressing. I can't." <laughs> and that was just really kind of telling for me. You know, even scientists can can get too depressed by just reading about this information. Anyway, so don't let it be overwhelm you. Okay, some advice to make meditation part of daily life. Anonymous attendee, join our weekly meditation classes if you can't on Friday night. If you can't do that, find one locally or find one that you can do and make it a regular practice. Uh, set a meditation target for yourself if you're not already of at least 20 minutes meditation per day five days a week. Don't try to meditate every day a week. Why? Because you'll miss a day and then you'll feel bad. So meditate five days a week, then you can miss a day and it's fine. You can even miss two days. It's still okay, but not three, right? And then get the regular practice. It's more important to have a regular practice than you can build up. Don't worry if you feel good about meditating. Don't worry if the meditating is working. Don't worry if uh, you're a good meditator. None of those things matter. What matters is you get on the cushion and you do it and you figure the rest of it out as you go along. All right. Uh, Gillian, 
Uh, how's it going, Gillian? Hope things are good where you are as well. Uh, and I hope you're not doing too badly in the heat. Um, I thought I heard you say that Samadhi gathers four factors. Should I have heard five? If not, which previous one doesn't get gathered? Ah, oh, I don't think I said four factors. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. I, I, either maybe I misspoke or you misheard. But anyway, it gathers together all of all of those previous factors. Perhaps I said all, not four. Anyway, I'm not sure. But yeah, it gathers together all of those factors. Okay. Good enough. Thank, yeah, thank you, Bhante. Uh, I will now invite Mr. Deepika. I think uh, he also has some uh, announcements to make. Uh, Deepika, over to you. I better unmute. Yeah, no, um, no, I just wanted to say thank you and also um, um, wish you all a happy new year. That's, uh, this is the last program for this year and the last full moon for this year. I um, also wanted to just um, let you know that we have a Zoom New Year's Eve um, uh, Dhamma meetup. So mm -hmm. if you are interested to join, you will get the opportunity to ask questions, clarify the questions that you couldn't clarify before, before the year passes. Uh, Bhante Sujato will be um, there. Um, so I just wanted to invite you to our um, Zoom Dhamma meeting or meetup. I will send the link to Professor Vatavala, and if you could, um, Professor, please share it with the audience. They can register and um, join. It is um, on Australian time from 8.30 p.m. to um, 12.30 a.m. Uh, last hour of the program will be a Dhamma talk meditation um, with Bhante Sujata, but the first um, couple of hours will be just loosely fitted program, and we'd love to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Deepika, for that invitation. And uh, we will also send it to our uh, Dhamma friends so that uh, they could attend. Uh, this, uh, I also want to uh, make the announcement. As I said, uh, there are two programs. Uh, the, there is one starting uh, also at 7.30 today. Uh, this is on uh, Kamma destroys Kamma and liberates the mind from suffering. So this has been uh, delivered by Bante Henapala Kunratna Mahathera, who is at uh, Virginia, USA. Uh, I think a lot of you all may have registered, but in the event, if you have not registered, so please uh, let me know so that I can send you the uh, link. Uh, so Bante, we are very, very uh, uh, thankful and uh, pay much merit to uh, Bante uh, for... This year, this is the last program that we are uh, having with Bhante Sujato. Of course, uh, Deepika has already invited you for the New Year event. Uh, the time difference is there, so maybe uh, uh, we can attend your one and then maybe uh, we can go for <laughs> our special events that we are having. Uh, so, Bhante, I think uh, 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 we, are, we are, I think, very, very fortunate uh, that with the association with uh, Sutta Central, uh, of course, uh, Deepika playing a major role in this and coordinating with uh, uh, Bante. Uh, the very many programs, uh, we had the uh, Sunday uh, the Sutta, uh, Sutta classes, uh, they were also very well attended. Then there was a Poya Days, uh, Vesak Poya, and uh, also the uh, other Poya Days that uh, Bante delivered. Uh, the uh, Dhamma programs and uh, uh, as we see it, we also like to, uh, our Dhamma friends would like to know the real, uh, maybe the different views that are uh, being expressed, which I think is very, very useful even today, uh, more on the practical area and also the relevance of uh, uh, what we are doing rather than just carrying on and doing uh, many things, but if we really know our uh, goals and objectives, uh, even with the simpler process, I think Banta is teaching us the simpler processes, uh, how we can uh, get there, and of course, uh, uh, not only have the effort and media, but also the happiness and joy uh, that everyone is uh, looking for. So, uh, once again, Bante, we are uh, very thankful, we pay much merit to you, and I know the the respect that you're having. There are so many uh, 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 venerables and also bhikkhunis and the uh, other 
uh, our participants who are present now venerable olande anand thero i think uh, uh, we are very thankful to venerable olande anand thero because uh, in fact i think uh, uh, this afternoon too i think uh, venerable olande anand thero is uh, involved in the sangavitta day program with the servants of the buddha so i'm sure uh, the a very very uh, great effort and the thinking and uh, uh, we have been uh, conducting these programs in uh, english language so it's a global language that we are using but i think uh, this is the way even for sri lanka to go because uh, uh, when uh, the um, uh, very reverend priests uh, who spread the dhamma from sri lanka of course starting from the vajira rama uh, the temple where they all uh, learned english and uh, they were able to go abroad and uh, uh, preach the dhamma so that's uh, and very many uh, countries they are having temples and uh, preaching the dhamma in those countries also the uh, many sri lankans who are there now especially in australia who are closely involved with the dhamma and i know a lot of them are daikas of uh, bante sujato so Uh, which is also a very great encouragement of course deepika is uh, live wire and uh, helping in all those events so we are really <laughs> to her. so bante uh, this year as i said has been very very good for us we have continued and interrupted the technology has uh, helped us uh, uh, the, actually i must say that uh, earlier we had to invite everyone to come to sri lanka and uh, it was a very very tedious process maybe a costly process but today <laughs> Uh, i think uh, it has been made very very easy very simple and uh, everyone uh, could listen to them uh, from their home but also where we get international speakers plus our sri lankan venerable uh, uh, will be also be able to give the dhamma sermons to the uh, for, uh, foreign country so this is a very good method by which the dhamma could be spread and and we very much uh, Uh, respect the major role played by bante sujatu uh, not only the uh, sutra central so uh, where one could not only to listen but also to read and uh, get all the teachings of uh, the buddha dham so bante we we uh, wish uh, uh, bante a very very uh, uh, maybe uh, it has been a very very fruitful year and also that the coming year Uh, would be uh, will bring us much more closer and uh, we will be able to work together uh, to spread the dhamma and also to conduct many programs uh, for dhamma friends and i also uh, uh, wish and pray that bante uh, sujato uh, will be able to continue this uh, very very uh, uh, important and also the buddhistic activities that have been done and very many will be able to uh, benefit from it and also to achieve the uh, ultimate goal that they are looking at so bante we also wish uh, the very good uh, health uh, and also that uh, uh, the covid 19 will not affect uh, 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 you and all the all the other priests and the uh, the uh, dhamma friends uh, so that uh, they could carry on their work uninterrupted and uh, play the major role and disseminate this uh, dhamma and also benefit from it because what i was reading is that uh, we have to do all these on our own we cannot uh, depend on others uh, or get others to do what we want to uh, do if we want to reach the ultimate goals that we are looking at so uh, bante may i now invite bante to give blessings to the departed and also to uh, the uh, uh, venerable priests and the dhamma friends who are present here and uh, in the closing of this year uh, that uh, uh, my uh, much uh, merit to bante on all activities that uh, have contributed for the development uh, of the buddhist activities uh, using the international dhamma group sadhu 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 ಆಕಾಶಕ್ಕೆ ಮಹಿಮೋದಿ ಚಿರಂಗ್ರಾಖಾಂತು ಲೋಕಸಾಸನಾ 